Okay, people, here we go. Um, uh, I boycotted Twitter. I'm on a 48-hour uh, Twitter boycott because of Wiley's anti-Semitism. Um, but I have got everything in uh, from other sources over the uh, last couple of, last day or two. Um, usual format, you can go to the original article if you don't understand what we're doing here. And last week's presentation is on new YouTube. Uh, you can also email me on chairrdrf at aol.com for links or slides. Okay, so uh, very big day for cycling policy today, uh, as uh, I'm going to say something about. Uh, Grant Shapps yesterday, we've got a once in a lifetime opportunity to create a shift in attitudes for generations to come. Uh, the measures we've set out today in this revolutionary plan will do just that. I don't actually went, know where Grand Shops was saying that from, but that's really a minor detail. Okay, so let's go uh, straight in. Today, there were formal announcements from the Prime Minister and the Minister of Transport. Okay, uh, that was the key phrase. Thousands of miles of protected bike lanes are promised. Uh, Johnson was saying that time to shift gears and press ahead with our biggest and boldest plans yet to boost active travel. And so uh, this is one of the biggest days. Uh, it follows on and I have to say I feel similarly about it um, to what I felt when the May announcements were made at the beginning of May. A lot of big promise but we have to be cautious about what we can expect from it. There are things that we have to be concerned about and there are issues of time scale as well, of course. Here are just some of the things which leapt out as things we would be looking forward to from the formal announcements, which I'll go into in a bit more detail soon. There is gonna be consultation on additional powers for local people to push for local low traffic neighborhoods, side street closures, etc. Uh, 12 mini Hollands are promised. The first ever zero emission city, or um, depending on what you read, at least one zero emission city center. Consultation to increase Metro Mayor's powers over key road networks. Uh, all adults and uh, and children who want it to get cycle training. The new standards for cycling and walking routes fully spelled out in updated official guidance, which is published. Uh, possible strengthening of the highway code. There's a consultation on that. Uh, giving councils new powers to traffic, to tackle some traffic offenses, which is really uh, just part of um, the part six of uh, the 2004 legislation. Pilot schemes for local authorities to give contracts in areas such as waste disposal to cycle freight companies. Uh, doctors prescribing cycling, we don't quite know what that means. An e-bike program, again, not quite sure what that will actually mean. Uh, and the first 50,000 vouchers um, uh, uh, 50 quid vouchers uh, will be released just before midnight tonight on a first come first served basis. Um, here's a quote from Peter Walker, uh, uh, which I think is interesting. If England does, as Prime Minister's promised, enjoy a new era of mass walking and cycling, then two of the primary reasons could be lurking within the more technical and unglamorous uh, elements of his two billion pound policy announcement, updated regulations and a new watchdog. Okay, so let's look at what's happened. The links you need to look at are this one, first of all, that's the press release. This one here, you will all have to download that and look at it and keep it. Uh, it's the cycling walking plan for England. It was uh, due to come in June. Uh, Labour parties pointed out it's now coming at the end of July, but better late than never. 
there is a consultation of uh, a review of the highway code and that's something which everybody will have to write in on there's some uh, good stuff on that uh, some less wonderful and here is the new transport note which phil jones and others have been involved in it's going to be called ltn 120 local transport note 120 and here's the voucher scheme to get involved with um, so i'm going to say some things about my initial impressions from this there they are those are the things you have to look at uh the the press note the actual plan the consultation uh, document and the actual design guidance there okay so cycling and walking plan for england my personal impressions in the forward uh johnson did actually talk about how uh he's cycling is wonderful but you can't use it for all journeys so i'm going to be spending billions of lots of money on buses rail and roads so we've still got the 27 billion pound roads building program which in terms of climate change is going to dwarf anything that we might do for cycling and walking he did also on the the cargo bike uh, thing a thing i saw he said, well, you can't carry a fridge freezer on a car, but go bike. Well, I remember the old Brox, which is exactly what you can carry a fridge freezer on. So uh, just a little personal note there. Uh, infographics on this document, I thought were excellent. Um, there's two billion pounds of funding over five years. Most people have talked about how we'd need six to eight billion, but Anyway, we've got the two billion. Uh, this is a comment. We will ensure that all new housing and business developments are built around making sustainable travel the first choice. Uh, a lot of people like my colleague uh, Richard Lewis have been pointing out that some of the developments in terms of, of, uh, of development of new buildings are actually not going in that direction. So there's some concerns there. Uh, we will commence the remaining elements of part six of the Traffic Management Act. Um, there was an announcement by the minister verbally, he said he'd do that. Uh, you, it was about three weeks ago, and then someone pointed out that actually the written answer said the opposite, but it now looks like it will commence. So there will be possibilities to do, for local authorities to do things with regard to uh, things like mandatory cycle lanes. Uh, we'll have to see how that uh, pans out. Um, all funding has to meet the new standards, including uh, programs like the Transforming Cities Fund. That is again made very clear that it has to do with what we were talking about before with re uh, reallocation of road space. It has to happen, it has to meet the new standards uh there will be deadlines uh you have to do things in a short period of time um now uh with regard to the highway code also we will introduce the offense of causing serious injury by careless or inconsiderate driving um i personally don't think that will necessarily work because you've still got the problem of juries letting drivers off also, the maximum sentence for causing death by dangerous driving or careless driving when under the influence of drink and drugs, that's only going to refer to a very small minority of cases and is a bit of a lightning conductor which uh, avoids the main issue, which is to give lower penalties for more normal forms of carelessness, which can uh, adversely affect the safety of people walking and cycling so not happy with that um, the higher the highway code we aim to introduce a high hierarchy of road users to ensure that those road users who can do the greatest harm have the greatest responsibility to reduce the danger or threat they may pose to others 
that is absolutely essential, important, game-changing, and all the rest of it. It will be fought by the Daily Mail and uh, the motoring lobby. We have to defend that. It's uh, Roger Geffen uh, was saying to me that it's basically just a, an anomaly that we don't have that in the Highway Code. I agree, but we do have to get this in. It's a crucial um, a principle to get in. Um, other changes in propose uh, greater clarity on pedestrian and cyclist priority at junctions. Uh, that's important. Introduce safe passing speeds and distance is that's also important for uh, close passing. Um, very important to get those changes in the highway code. Okay, so I'm going to uh, look at some, again, personal impressions on the principles uh, for cycle infrastructure design, which are actually in the main document, um, which uh, came out and struck me anyway. Um, cycle infrastructure should be accessible to everyone from eight to 80 and beyond. It should be planned and designed for every, uh, everyone. The opportunity to cycle in our towns and cities should be universal. A lot of stuff about uh, special needs cycle, uh, adapted cycles. It's big on inclusivity. That's important. Uh, cycles must be treated as vehicles and not as pedestrians. Uh, on urban streets, cyclists must be physically se separated from pedestrians and should not share space with pedestrians. Kind of thing John Parkin's been talking about for ages. Very important. Uh, physically separated from high volume motor traffic uh, at junctions and in between. Side street routes, if closed to through traffic to avoid rat running, can be an alternative to segregated facilities or closures on main roads, but only if they are truly direct. Cycle infrastructure should be designed for significant numbers of cyclists and for non-standard cycles. Our aim is that thousands of cyclists a day will use many of these schemes. Uh, consideration of the opportunities to improve provision for cycling will be an expectation of any future local highway schemes. You know, all crucially important points. Uh, largely cosmetic interventions which bring fewer new benefits for cycling and walking will not be funded from any cycling or walking budget. Eight. Cycle infrastructure must join together or join other facilities together by taking a holistic connected network approach. Crucially important. Um, on the home parking thing, it's uh, talking about having on street lockers and hangers and so on. I would have liked to have seen something about facilitating parking in people's homes or on ground which is owned by landlords. Bit of a disappointment. Um, uh, trials can help achieve change and ensure a permanent scheme is right first time. Important point. And uh, again, something else which leapt out at me, access control measures such as chicane barriers and dismount signs should not be used. Pretty important. Uh, there are other few points highlighted in the main document it, like on to do with maintenance and materials, which uh, uh, I haven't actually highlighted here. So it's all pretty powerful stuff. If we get it, uh, this is, you know, real game changer. Um, I did uh, originally put in the stuff about how LTN, what is now LTN 120 has been delayed, the uh, main document being delayed, uh, but, and the vouchers weren't ready, they now are. What is, uh, whoops, what is delayed? Uh, I think there's been slow progress with stuff on the ground nationally and in London, but uh, uh, with regard to the main national things, the delays are really with the inspectorate and the active travel commissioner, which, um, are due to happen this summer, whatever that means. Um, okay, so that's really uh, all the stuff on those main four documents which you have to look at. 
the uh, the main plan, which is in there, the LTN 120 and the highway code consultation. Those are the main things you have to look at yourself on those links. Um, okay, I'm now going to go away from that onto other stuff which has been happening. Um, right. Uh, an update on Sam Manga's UK stats. Uh, he's changed the method of doing that. Don't forget, this is all very fluid stuff for cycling, all very noisy. Uh, looks like cycling is at about 40% more than it was before lockdown. Uh, car usage at about 80%. Bus usage way, public transport way down. Uh, these two may go up, so cycling, we don't know what will happen unless stuff starts going in on the ground ASAP. We're still at crunch time over August and into September. Don't forget that. Um, these are DFT figures uh, for travel in lockdown. Just briefly say 11% uh, said more cycling than before as against 6% less, 33% uh, more walking as against 19% less. Uh, during lockdown, there was 13% uh, uh, once a week or more cycling, which is more uh, than you normally get. Uh, okay, now other stuff I want to talk about some things other than infrastructure it was a survey, you know, the kind of these sort of random things that go in from motoring organizations, a survey saying, despite friction amongst the motorists, it is important to remember that the safety of each group, this was on cyclists and motorists, relies on the actions of the other. So uh, apparently cyclists are threatening the lives of motorists and they won't be safe unless we behave ourselves. Uh, this kind of false equivalence drivel is coming out all the time. At Green Flag, we conducted this research to wear, raise awareness of this, to ensure that drivers recognize that there will be likely more cyclists on the streets. Uh, it's almost as if you don't have to worry about cyclists unless there's a lot of them. And for the increasing number of cyclists to be conscious of their role in sharing the road safely with motorists. Usual uh, false equivalence. Um, okay. Uh, important news, Transport Action Network have been permitted to challenge the government road building plans. They're bringing a case against the five-year road investment strategy on climate change and air quality grounds. Do go to their links and do support them. Very important. Um, here's an interesting article on uh, uh, low uh, traffic neighborhoods. Um, this is based on Lambeth, so uh, Simon may uh, uh, be interested in that. He was talking about that being on Newsnight tomorrow. Um, what was interesting is Will Self, who's basically very pro walking and cycling, uh, you can see him around London on his Titanium Brompton. Um, he was saying, oh no, it's just uh, uh, shifting uh, traffic around. And there is a point, LTNs do take a while to settle down. A lot of us would argue you need a lot more to reduce motor traffic, uh, pricing, law enforcement, and so on. Uh, but an interesting article being sympathetic to low traffic neighborhoods. Okay, 22nd of July, the 2020 Comprehensive Spending Review was launched. Now, if you want that two billion fund for cycling and walking schemes in England to be boosted towards the six to eight billion that's been talked about. This is where we need to get that money from. So campaigning for more money from the comprehensive spending review. Okay, and just a reminder about the second tranche of the Emergency Active Travel Fund invitation. The submission deadline is Friday the 7th of August, uh, certainly for local authorities in England outside London. I'm not sure about uh, London. Um, 
and here's the wording which is very good very forceful all cycling schemes permanent or temporary will need to include segregation or point closures uh, advisories and those marked only with white paint will not be funded and funding will also depend on how swiftly and effectively authorities have implemented the plans for which they received first tranche funding. Okay, uh, stuff that's going in, a sign that's worth a thousand words. Here's Thurrock, uh, this sign was put up. Beware cycling rules relaxed. What the hell does that mean? Uh, it's absolutely meaningless. And Coventry, this was from Adam Tranter. Priority over oncoming pedestrians. So presumably you stand here and when this guy comes along in his mobility scooter, you shout at him for not having given way to you. I mean, it, this is really dreadful. I mean, look at how wide this carriageway is. Oh dear. Uh, okay, now some um, stuff opposing pushback. This is the bike is best people. Um, Ian Walker uh, has been behind that. Uh, note that name. Also given publicity by Peter Walker at The Guardian, The Conspiracy of Pedestrians. Um, some stuff on the graphics local measures to enable cycling are supported by 6.5 people for every one against and uh some stuff about the kind of graphics they're using supporters as against opponents um interesting 3.73 agree that children should be able to play in the street without dangers from cars cutting through uh only 3.73 is against one uh, on the ground stuff, uh, here's Leicester. They, they were planning to do one mile of routes every week. They've done 11 miles and here's their fancy new map. Uh, look at what Leicester have been doing. Uh, Greater Manchester, this transformation from here with cones to with wands and cylinders was due to happen this week. This was actually being talked about in May, but it is supposed to have gone in this week. Uh, Hampshire, bad stuff, pushback. Uh, if temporary pop-up schemes are not effective for whatever reason, uh, then they will come out. So this one has come out in Basingstoke. Uh, North Ants, uh, Mr. Jones is going to be talking about that, uh, going over the various things about how, uh, what are they actually planning to do, spend their tranche one funding on? Uh, what are they going to be busying on for tranche two? We don't know. Um, so uh, we will need the, the family bicycle to be on the case for North Ants because they are apparently not being clear about what they're spending money on or what they're bidding for. Uh, okay, a few other bits and pieces. Bolton University, a thousand bikes have been given by Halfords, which are going to be used by students. Um, Edinburgh, I see stuff on Twitter saying that things are about to happen. Edinburgh so far been lagging behind. Hopefully they'll move forward. Uh, now Inverness, very interesting press article here. I do like talking about how people talk about things and uh, images, messages, and so on. So you read this thing from the Inverness Courier, those of you who don't get it. Um, the uh, heading was, End one-way traffic chaos, demand business leaders. So you read through the article and it's all about how this one-way traffic chaos, it's terrible and they, everybody's going to die, it's all horrible. And then you read later on, in an in online consultation, 962 com comments were submitted, quite a lot. An overwhelming 68.8% said they were in support of the interventions proposed while a petition urging the council to go further 
was signed by more than 2,400 people. So, you know, uh, the actual story looks like being the precise opposite of what the heading was. Um, pool also, again, what's happening? Uh, a railway bridge, uh, there is uh, supposedly a closure to vehicles and people have been grumbling about, is it a trial? What about the consultation? Well, you know, what do you need in terms of consultations if it is a trial? Okay, now, big story for me, uh, because I'm a Regents Park person, but this did get a lot of public attention. I want to spend some time on it. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming you don't read the Daily Mail. So here is a story about Cycling Mikey, uh, who is described as the lycra-clad vigilante who shopped stationary Guy Ritchie texting behind the wheel, road safety warrior prides himself on having caught 358 drivers. Um, so uh, you can read my thread on that there. Some comments, you know, let's deconstruct what those words and meanings are. The usual lycra clad, uh, usual um, uh, form of abuse for people who may or may not have lycra in some of their clothing. Vigilante, if you look that up in the dictionary, you see it's someone who takes the law into their own hands, uh, as opposed to someone who actually informed the police about some law breaking which threatens other people's lives and for which the penalty is only a small fine and a few penalty points. Um, shopped, you know, it's like grass, fink, being well odd, you know, something out of a Guy Ritchie film, the Daily Mail starts using this kind of language. Um, warrior, uh, again, I looked that up. It's someone who practices warfare. Uh, this is actually somebody who just took some video of someone breaking the law, which doesn't seem to me to be taking part in warfare. Um, and of course, Guy Ritchie already had a uh, set of convictions for various motoring offenses. Uh, and with the extra points, he just gets a ban for six months, which someone like him should experience as no kind of restriction at all, uh, given his wealth. Um, according to Linus Reese, he is actually an urban cyclist. He does ride around central London and uh, his ex-wife does as well. So here is my excuse to have a photograph of Madonna riding a bicycle. There you go. I like that photo. Now, um, Superintendent Cox of the Met made this comment about the story. The story here should be one of a driver penalized for using a phone whilst driving, which greatly increases the chances of a fatal crash and the devastation that follows. Mikey Cycling should be praised for vast public service and considerable help and report support to road safety. Very important to have that supportive message. Um, again, another tweet from Superintendent Cox. He is Detective Superintendent, Roads and Transport, Policing Command, Metropolitan Police. He's about number two, number three in what is actually the biggest roads policing force in Europe. Uh, and he says, and do use this quote if you need to be supportive, I encourage use of head, of head cam and believe it has dangerous driving deterrence, investigative and enforcement benefits. I feel it has made a difference in terms of cycling safety by raising awareness of issues such as close pass and is influencing improvements in driving standards. You could also talk about how dash cams and indeed smartphones are being used for the safety of all road users. So, that's important, important to get this episode seen in the right way. Um, I did see, uh, let's see, here we are in London, um, interesting article there, London-wide driver charging is being hinted at by the government, and there's the issues about TfL budget. Um, uh, the London Assembly Transport Committee, um, Will Norman was there, along with my old boss, Alex Williams, 
he did a nice takedown of the traffic is like water mythology with regard to the to low traffic neighborhoods um he unfortunately ended his comments with this has all shown that we can act fast i would say action in london particularly by tfl hasn't been that fast um here's a thing about cycle training um which uh he was i actually was talking with will norman about uh, at the end of march we're now finally getting this online skills course up uh it was unfortunately called uh to start off with the cycles kills uh was in the uh web title which was a bit unfortunate but that's a minor point and there is now sixty thousand pounds to every london borough for cycle training, uh, confidence training for local residents. I do hope it's given in the right way and it isn't the usual lids and high vis and off you go kind of thing. Um, in London, the Euston Road cycle lanes went in, in Saturday, on Saturday. Uh, I had a look at Twitter then. Uh, I would urge people to get involved, you know, uh, on Twitter do thank people like Superintendent Cox for the traffic law enforcement. And also, you know, why not join in tweets like this? Uh, most of the replies to which um, were actually hostile. It would, I think, give a good impression if you say, yeah, it's a good thing, or make some criticism of the cabbies. Uh, about a quarter of the people on the thread, you know, nearly nearly half of the people opposing it were cabbies um, or apparently cabbies. Uh, this is the thing that I quoted last week from LCC. Would be give more clarity about what's happening, more mentoring on bor for boroughs to do the right thing and more oversight to make sure that money is spent in the right way as we've heard talked about with regard to the national plans. Uh, now, this is something from Camden, I noticed. This has gone in, uh, ones, this is on Prince of Wales Road. Uh, these are gonna be coming out, obviously. Um, uh, the build outs are due to go, and the bus stop here will be a shared use bus border. Uh, as in Royal College Street. So it's not a full on uh, floating bus stop type thing, but it's the old type of design which went in Royal College Street. Uh, I mention this partly because when you see something like that, instead of saying, oh dear, that's a bit stupid, you know, just remember the contractors have probably been scheduled to come in a few days later to remove that and you know, hopefully change the junction in the appropriate manner. I also mention it because there is apparently a loss of some 46 car parking spaces. That to me is exactly what we want to see. So let's see how that scheme progresses in Camden. Also in Camden, uh, a new word, streeteries. Okay, this is referring to the al fresco dining, which we're seeing popping up. Uh, Camden's looking to have more of these in various streets you may know about in Camden. Um, there has been various stuff throughout the UK about open air dining, particularly in Soho, but elsewhere throughout the UK. Um, it does show how nice streets can be without cars. Um, for me, it's not, you know, one of the headline things for getting Joanne Normal to ride her bike down to the shops but it is interesting uh, even with that word. Um, okay, more stuff from London, Haringey, dear oh dear, that's just pushing sightless further out. It's because of some building development there. Uh, that is, uh, I don't know what it is. It's something's gone in with the building work, not really a footway extension because there's a barrier there, a bit annoying. Um, Westminster loss of oh just five car parking spaces from uh, the infamous uh, Westminster City Council uh, but they are being lost in quite important places where um, uh, you have very rich people 
uh, parking cars and the, it would be nice to see myself, uh, people paying very large amounts of money to park in these kind of areas. But anyway, they are making an effort with five car parking spaces and um, being replaced with some cycle parking. Um, uh, Kingston, one scheme funded was a segregated cycle lane, which has uh, got a lot more people cycling. Now, uh, here's something from Lewisham from Roger Stocker uh, about uh, low traffic neighborhoods which uh, have the signage uh, disobeyed. Nice clear signage on Dermody Road showing no access for motor vehicles apart from motorcycles. The, um, uh, plus big warning of camera enforcement, part of the Lee Green low traffic neighborhood, but it's not being enforced apparently. Or if it is being enforced by cameras and all these people are getting uh, notices of intending prosecution in the post, um, it's not being effective at the moment. So I think we will have to talk about whether low traffic neighborhoods are actually working um, in cases where you are relying on camera enforcement. Uh, Richmond Park now open to cycles. Uh, we may need a special session on whether low traffic neighborhoods are actually working. Um, and here's the stuff about Alex's virtual safaris and this guy's Twitter th uh, threads. Uh, there are your old uh, lots of reading campaigns. I've mentioned these previous years, uh, previous weeks. Please uh, look at these uh, links. And uh, also in particular, the consultations. Uh, the one on transport decarbonization, please go to that. I found actually the link didn't work for me and I kept on being cut off, but please get on that. You know what to say. Uh, don't forget the roads policing consultation and the bus lanes and uh, also, of course, the highway code. So a lot there. There we go. Thanks very much. OK, uh, firstly, Brian, thanks for having us. Um, uh, thanks for, well, I don't know. Well, we will say thank you at the end. I don't know. It, it, we, uh, we might well get it entirely wrong. Um, so... I'm Chris, Director of Training for Pedal Me. Um, with me is James Holloway. Um, together we've kind of really led on the R&D uh, policy and risk assessment pretty much from the very beginning of the company. Um, but this presentation isn't really about Pedal Me. It's not about selling our company or delivery service to anyone. I think a lot of people in this room kind of know what we're up to um, and, and what we've been doing. Um, so, but, but what we are is we're a, a company doing logistics by cargo bike. We want cargo bike logistics to grow. Um, and that's not just about us doing it. It's about everybody doing it as much as possible. But what we are is aware of many of the issues that the business faces um, with the uptake of cargo bikes and the transition to, um, from vans because uh, we're dealing with, with, you know, most of those issues ourselves on a daily basis. Um, this isn't about general population level cycling. This isn't about civilian cycling, or, or if, if you want to call it that, we will for the sake of argument. Uh, this is about cycling for commercial use. It's a different space, it's a different area, and we believe it should be treated differently. Um, so I just wanted to kind of firstly examine what what success is is going to look like for e-cargo bikes. Um, firstly, the aim for local authorities and, and the state really is to remove as many unnecessary journeys made by motor vehicles, be that van, private hire vehicles uh, or, or anything else. But we're pri prim primarily focused with you know, uh, taxis and with small van journeys. Um, with our bikes. Um, ambitious targets have been set, you all know that. Um, the aim for businesses um, using sort of some examples like Mighty, Morgan Sindel, Speedy Hire, uh, Lyrico, um, companies that we've done kind of little case studies and little trials with, they're on board, but what their aim is is that business as usual. They don't want too much disruption in what they're doing. 
and they want to be doing things cleaner and they, they want to reduce their emissions. You know, business wants this. We all want this. They want to do the right thing, but they, they've still got to make money. They've still got to minimize any kind of operational or reputational risk and they've, they've got to maximize the output. So cargo bikes can help do that. We know this, um, you know this, they're cleaner. Um, an e-cargo bike needs to have done at least 250,000 miles to catch up with the embedded carbon of an electric vehicle before an EV is even done its first job. So, you know, and that's not even a comparison to fossil fuels, that's an EV and, you know, cargo bikes are just supremely efficient in comparison. Um, they beat traffic, so we know they're faster. Uh, we know they're more efficient because at pick up and drop off, you can get things on them and off of them right next to the front door with any, without any real restrictions. Um, and they, they cost less on an ongoing basis. So there's fewer overheads, they're less costly to repair. Uh, you know, uh, any kind of leasing charge on them would be lower. So businesses are interested in using cargo bikes either on a service level or in you know going the whole hog and replacing fleets of vans with fleets of cargo bikes you know there's there's interest there certainly um so we're we're kind of at the kind of real working case study stage rather than having to really do any heavy fighting um to to kind of get acceptance that we can, that we need to try this out however there's a lot of barriers and I want to kind of go into some of those and, and, and talk about them a little bit. Before we kind of go into the barriers, um, are we putting up the picture? To the barriers. Yeah, okay, cool. let's go into the barriers, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So first big barrier is that there's essentially a huge knowledge and skills gap in the way of, of full utilization of cargo bikes. The efficiency that, that cargo bikes can bring is all about using them to their maximum capacity. It's not just putting a single box in there and doing a journey and, and coming out with a bit of greenwash. It's about making sure that they are laden to their maximum capacity as much as possible so that they can do as many jobs out there to do as, as, as they have capacity to. However, if you lose operational capacity through a lack of planning or a lack of understanding or a lack of trust cargo bikes will always lose out we know how to use vans you open the door you shove stuff in them they go cargo bikes are that simple in utilization but you've got to trust them and then when you start riding them when they're fully laden they are difficult um, they need to be able to carry a lot they must be able to carry it safely and the skill of the operator, the user of that bike, is just as important as the capacity of the vehicle. You've got to have both of these elements at least working well together. And then you've also got to be able to, to fix them and fix them quickly. Uh, because if you've got a bike down, it's not being used and it needs to be up and using. Another barrier for business is essentially, now this is a big concept and we're not going to go into all of it right now, hopefully we'll explore it a little bit later, is risk. Um, there are currently no set standards for professional cycling. We know about national standards, we know that the, the guidelines that exist, but there's no, there's no set industrial standards for what these bikes can and cannot do. And in logistics, in every other element, to every other vehicle, moving people, moving things, there's regulation. So how can industry trust something that is essentially unregulated? Cycles appear to come with significant risk to reputation, risk to service, risk to reliability, and we can't expect business to act on and trust in something that they simply do not understand and that isn't formally recognized and has no framework. We need that in place. Um, there's a barrier in, in company culture. If you've always done something by van, how do you make that transition? Who on the ground in the business actually wants to move from a van to cargo bike? There will be resistance to change to people who feel that they don't want to get wet, that they don't want associations with cyclists or cycling or be associated with that necessarily with, with the, the out group that, that, that 
essentially cyclists find themselves in, if not by choice. How do you get that kind of corporate buy-in? How do you convince the van driver, the manager, that you know that, that cargo bikes are the right direction to go? And then you've also got to overcome the disbelief in the potential of cargo bikes. How can you convince that moving high volumes is actually low risk? From a professional motorist perspective, moving things by cargo bike in itself is not professional and therefore trusted. And we've got to respond to that view. We've got to accept it. We can't fight it. We must placate it. And we have to adapt to the needs of businesses. And we need to attempt to at least create a culture of competency and full responsibility. Responsibility is key. Too often in cycle logistics, responsibility is outsourced and offset to the individual. And it isn't as accepted at any corporate level. There are reasons for that. We're not going to go into those here. As I said, you know, that's a big one. So this is what happens when it, it goes wrong. Um, what you're seeing here is essentially. Can, just check everyone can, can everyone see this? I can't. I, I mean, can everyone see this picture? Get a nod or a thumbs up or something like that. So, yeah, we can see it. yeah cracking. Uh, it's a bit blurry. It's a screenshot that I took off of iPlayer once. You can probably recognize that, but anyway. Um, e cargo bike parked outside King's Cross Station from the. Um, yeah, from, from the estate up there. Essentially, it's been bought to go, well, let's give e-cargo bikes a go. We reckon this can do a job here. And it, it, for occasional movement, um, for tools, materials, ETC, it's, it's been bought without the intention of using it for high utilization, which defeats its purpose. Um, also, it, it's, it's seen as difficult to ride. If you can ride a bicycle, it does simply not transpire that you can ride a cargo bike safely and confidently. Um, so it gets put in the corner, mothballed. And as you can see here, it's been relegated to basically being used as a newspaper recycling bin which was probably not its, you know, its bought intention. But what else are you going to do with it if you haven't got comprehensive skills to utilise it? So there's some of the barriers. We've got to overcome them. And I'm just going to kind of give three things that I think we can start doing um, to overcome these barriers. They're, there's a lot that we need to do. But firstly, we've got to build trust. We need defined standards and where pertinent, we need to align those standards with incumbent industry standards so that the construction industry, the facilities management industry, um, the food industry for, for whatever use they want to come out with can say, actually, this is a legitimate vehicle that can do a job for us. We need to placate people that have trained hard and, been, and jump through various hoops to do what they do professionally. Otherwise, it simply won't be taken seriously. And we need to placate those who are gonna be on the receiving end of the change. We need promotion. We've got to promote cargo bike use for business as a skilled activity. It's not just get on the bike. You, if you just put a cargo bike in someone's hand and load it up, you'll destroy confidence in both the individual and the vehicle and in the industry in itself. So you've got to build and recognize necessary skills and confidence in cargo bikes from the perspective of the rider doing the job and the industries that are paying people to do it. Without that trust on both levels, you'll get ineffective utilization, you'll get risk, you'll get unhappy staff. It's not the way forward. And to back this, you, you need ongoing government support. It can't just be left to business to take this risk. It needs state assistance and it can't just be just purchasing assets and handing them over and saying, there you go. We've got to have some state acknowledgement and share in the risk in the implementation and utilization of cargo bikes. And that's gonna need knowledge on all sides. And it's gonna need sharing of that knowledge and working together with businesses to, to grow this thing. It's not about assets, it's not about capital, it's about supporting 
people through this change? Um, thank you. Uh, questions to the floor, please, if there are any. It's been a long kind of gestation. We finished the first draft of it, I think, in April May last year, and we thought it was going to come out in September. And then along came Mr. Gilligan and um, asked for it to be strengthened, which is fantastic. So the, um, the, 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 the kind of numbers 1 to 20 at the start where it says, do this, don't do that, is very much um, taken from, from the, the work that he did with Brian on uh, LCDS. You know, much clearer, punchier start, which is great. We strengthen the, um, the, 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 the statements about this now applies to, to all new highways that Bob picked up on. Um, and uh, it's not a book to be just picked up when, you, when people are designing cycle facilities. It's a book to be picked up when people are designing any change or any new bit of highway. And, um, you know, and, and then I think the fact that we're going to get Active Travel England that's going to hold local authorities to account to apply this is absolutely fantastic. Because, you know, I've, I've spent a fair chunk of my career writing guidance. And it's so frustrating when you produce something and it's just widely ignored. And I mean, an example of that is the current uh, CD195, which is the standard for Highways England on cycle infrastructure that uh, we did with um, uh, John Parkin and, and again with Adrian Lord, which Highways England just don't apply. You know, they, they've got to get out clause. They say, well, if it's shared use, it doesn't apply. And therefore there's absolutely uh, no value in the standard because it, uh, uh, you know, it's never picked up. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I think in some ways you could probably categorize this as, as DFT catching up with local government, with people like Brian and, you know, the work you've been doing. Um, we, we had to fight quite hard to get Cyclops in there. We, we don't use the word Cyclops because the DFT didn't recognize it, but I think we called it circulating pedestrian and cycle stage junctions. Um, so there's quite a lot. I hope there's quite a lot of good stuff. Um, we put in a, a really clear chart, we think, that says when to segregate. Uh, or not when to segregate, actually, just talk about the implications of segregation. So what it, the new chart says um, that there's still a value in segregating even on the quietest street because that will be fully inclusive. You know, so it doesn't say, as the old graphs did, below this line you integrate and above this line you segregate. It just says what are the implications of segregating or integrating in different contexts and whether you will exclude people or not. And that's the approach that we've taken. So a big thread that runs through the whole document. I was just chatting to Lucy Marstrand as well, who was uh, some of you, many of you know Lucy. She was on our sounding board, as was Mark Strong and others. And we had a really, really good support from, from people. And Brian helped us as well. Um, but a big thread through the whole document is inclusivity. Wills for Wellbeing were very helpful. You'll see there are photographs of people out there on, on recumbents and trikes and Kevin Hickman's in there. It's a, a kind of spot spot the um spot the the the, the person uh, in the document you know so um we hope it's a step forward i'm sure there'll be things that people disagree with um and could be better inevitably but i think it's a major major move on from ltn 208 um i, I haven't seen it announced but we also pressed them really hard to withdraw ltn 112 which is the shared use we said um we've redefined shared use by the way we've removed the stupid Thing about segregated and unsegregated shared use. We've said shared use is shared use because it's shared. You know, uh, there's no no white line. White line's no good. It's a footway. It's a cycle track and a footway, not one thing that's split down the middle. Um, so there's we we hope there's some kind of clearer messages in there. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a very very quick intro. But um, uh, maybe any any quick questions on the chat? I've been looking, but. Yeah, yeah I, I could bring up a little bit of the junction assessment tool because that, okay, yeah, that, that's what I really wanted to, to talk about. I think um, the big game changes for me, like it was in the London Cycling Design Standard, is the, the cycling level service and the junction assessment tool. So whatever you pick out of the rest of the 180 pages has to go through that kind of grinder to see whether it kind of meets the funding aspirations and, and really what kind of quality you're talking about. So I think that's a, that's a real big one. But like you mentioned the issue that uh, with CD195 or whatever about the shared use get out and there's still that kind of a gap in the cycling level of service and the junction assessment tool. It's okay if you just throw cyclists on the footway, then we'll kind of we'll kind of give it a green. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to show a couple of slides on on the way we've been using the the um, Go for it. The 
assessment tool in Manchester and kind of because we've been putting pedestrian stuff in as well that's the that's the other thing I'd quite like to hear from you about I'm getting all my questions in and not giving anybody else a chance but hey that's that's what happens when you invite people to get drinks um, really about um you know the active travel England and and it's walking and cycling this is very much cycling stuff and the and the cycling design drawings in there that don't have any pedestrian crossings associated with them and 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 what do we do about that and i'll be waiting for that to come through is it picked up in manual for streets three don't know whether you've got any uh, observations on that while i'm loading up a, a picture of a junction assessment tool so i can show it off so, so, uh, the, i know there has been talk about a walking walking infrastructure design so a parallel document but manual for streets currently does include quite a lot and then we you know we've also got inclusive mobility so i think in the past walking is there's been greater um, consistent guidance on walking so maybe the need hasn't been quite so great but I think you know I was again I was chatting to John Dales earlier today about whether there should be a companion document. Um, Manual for Streets um, yeah so there is an intention now to revise it. Um, CIHT is embarking on that process um, so but it might take a couple of years uh, to, to get that done. I mean all, these things always take longer than, than a first thought so uh, updating manual for streets, combining manual for streets one and two, is is going to be a big old big old task. Um, but yeah, it, it obviously needs to be done. The I think the the important thing here was to was to to move on beyond LTN two hundred eight, which was you know frankly becoming an embarrassment really. Um, so I, I think that was the most pressing thing to do. But as ever, there's 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 more to do. Okay, so stay there. I'm just going to share this um, picture. Um... I'm segueing into my talk while still involving uh, uh, Phil there because I wanted to get some questions. But yeah, this is a kind of early version that I showed of the uh, junction assessment tool. I'm going to show what we've done. It. So there's a there's a drawing in the new standards, and uh, I'm really trying to get everybody to use this, particularly because it uh, really helps promote protected junctions. Um, Basically, it's just a really simple way of showing how easy or hard is it to make every single manoeuvre rather than like thinking, all right, a super highway goes through there. Let's get people across. Well, on a crossroad junction, there's 12 possible movements that people can make. What are the others like? And there's just like a basic colour coding system of like anybody could do it, 8 to 80. That's actually kind of green. Um, most people who do everyday cycling will do it. That's actually kind of a, uh, amber. Or this is a bit tricky. This is for the likes of Bob. And the, and the real experts out there to, to give, a bit, give it a go. And the other code is the kind of black with a cross line. It's just banned. And you assign points to them and you get an overall junction score. Just a really simple way of looking at junctions rather than uh, getting bogged down in all the terminology and, uh, and the technical stuff. And everybody's thinking about like capacity and they start weighing you down with stats. Just uh, how easy or hard is it to get in there? So it's uh, it sounds really simple to say, but we tied ourselves in knots at Transport for London trying to to achieve all green on this uh, on this one. Uh, there's only really Lee Bridge Road and Cyclops that have got all greens, all directions, these junctions. I just want to quickly show one that I use in training. Come on, Brian. Uh, this is like kind of standard T junction in the UK. So you can see the colors in. What, what's different about this one is those kind of thicker lines of the pedestrian stuff. So what mm. I will add, um, and I still think it's worth doing it when you're laying out the cycle, when you're following Bill's brilliant guidance to, to think about the pedestrian ones. The, the really simple way we do pedestrians is like if it if it's not catered for, you look on the right of the picture there, like it's a, it's a banned pedestrian movement on an obvious desire line, black, that's a zero point. Uh, when it's kind of a staggered, we do it as amber, um, or where it's straight across, it's kind of green. Let's show the after. That's the pedestrian one. And you can see the cycling movements are the kind of thinner ones. So going ahead on a road like this, three lanes of traffic, both directions, that's going to be difficult. Doing the rights is going to be really difficult. Um, every kind of movement, uh, compared to a kind of Cyclops stuff in there, uh, you can see there's a there's still a tricky merge onto the Cyclops arrangement from the side road, but, but it's not bad. Um, pretty much an all green for cyclists, whatever movement you want to make. And, and you see the pedestrians on one side, because it's straight across on the desire line, you get a green man, conflict free, great that's green, whereas the one on the right, because it's staggered, we did a kind of a amber, and the red is kind of sprinting across in the in the intergreens, the kind of classic uh, UK one. So I just wanted to show a few pictures there and uh, uh, maybe get um, Phil's observations on that. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. No, it's really good. I think, I think you know, it, uh, as in most of my career, I've survived by stealing good ideas from other people. And uh, 
this was one of uh, Brian and, and, and Rachel. So no, it, it's great. And uh, I mean, um, uh, Mark, Mark Strong and I were talking, we looking at some stuff the other day of some uh, emergency pop-up stuff that's being proposed um, where, you know, lanes are being coned off going into, re into roundabouts uh, and they're coned all the way through. So it's great if you want to do the left turn, um, but if you as a cyclist want to go any other direction at the roundabout, you simply can't do it. You know, it, it's, it's ridiculous. So clearly if you, if you ran the junction assessment, then that would, would, would score very poorly because those turns were just not, not possible. So I think that is, that is very important. So yeah, we've, we've, um, it was a real fine line between guidance and standards. I mean, DFT, because they're not a highway authority, they don't publish standards, but they wanted something with teeth. So we said, um, getting the, the, the two audit tools. So we've got a cycling level of service tool, the link based thing, which is the same, um, format as in the Welsh Active Travel Design Guide, um, so we, we, which is a very slight simplification of the original TFL one that Brian did. Um, so we've got that in, so there's consistency between England and Wales, um, and we think those are really important. So while, while it, it, you know, local authorities can flex things a little bit, they can develop their own standards, that's fine, they're allowed to do that. Um, the audit tool is the audit tool, and, and presumably that's the thing that um, Active Travel England will be doing to assess whether, whether this is being applied. Brilliant, okay, I've had him to myself for enough. Has anybody got any questions? I can pick them out of the chat if you're, if you're shy or, or you know, can't be asked, but maybe your room's a mess, it's fine. There was one about um, access control barriers on, on paths, Phil. Everybody's uh, vain and you talked about inclusivity. Is this the place to point to say, no, don't do that scumbag? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 one of the ones right. So um, the, one of the Andrew Gilligan uh, twenty points to pick up is right at the start. Um, so I forget which which number it is. I need to I need to go through this actually just to make sure there's nothing snuck in at the end that <laughs> that we didn't like. But it look it all looks pretty familiar. But um, yeah, so it's 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 very yeah. So number sixteen, it says um, access control measures such as such as chicane barriers and dismount signs should not be used. Very good. So that's really clear. They reduce the usability of a route for everyone and may exclude people rising, riding non-standard cycles and cargo bikes. So the, 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 it's it's really clear. And there's a photo that, that, that says that. Well, Brian, what, what do you yep. feel about where we go with existing stuff on that score? Because I could take a battery angle grinder around Wellingborough and it would take me three or four days to get shot of them all, but I yep. could make it compliant remarkably cheaply and quickly. What do we feel about the, the notion of actually saying, well, that one is perfectly achievable on existing infrastructure with a very low opportunity cost. I think there might be some questions about would you go down the French line of having give way signs on some parts if you were approaching a, a, a essentially a T-junction with a road. But to mm. be saying, as I look through those design principles, that one is one that you can retrofit mm. to existing infrastructure very, very quickly. Should we be turning the screw to say that's one where there's no excuse not to go back and fix it? I, yeah. I, mean, I think, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, and I think that might come through the LC WIP process. So, one of the other announcements in the in in the um, the changing gear was that it's going to be great support for these local cycling walking infrastructure plans. So that's a, you know that, that there's guidance out there, and that needs to be updated as well in the light of experience. But but that that says where's the existing network? Is it up to scratch? How can it be improved and extended and 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 built? And and I think that's where you would. You would come in and in that in that audit of the existing network, so you could apply these audit tools and say, okay, we've got a cycle network of sorts, and it may not be about entirely new routes, but it might be bringing those routes up to standard, and and, and the audit tool would be perfect for that because you know you're looking at something and scoring something that really exists. I, I just wonder whether it's an opportunity, particularly as we get into tranche two funding, to be saying to local authorities. Actually, this doesn't require any extra effort. You don't need to do a load of navel gazing on this one. It doesn't necessarily need to go that far down the planning process. You just need to know that these are now, you know, persona non grata on our parts. You need yeah. to go and take, take them all out. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I do even wonder whether, we, whether it's something where we ought to get to the stage now of taking some of it into our own hands with some of the barriers. That, that exists. I know in Hull, somebody had already had a good go at, at one of the parts. Get your local authority to do it. Get your local. I'm, I'm, there's a couple more questions, Phil. So I'm going to like uh, try and bounce along. But I'll also say the principles are the top ranking things that you must do. Then it's towards the kind of level of service. So uh, that's that's really one that depends where you are in the organisation on your on your policy. Unless you had something gripping, I want I want to bring um, Tim in. Who's got a question for you, Phil? 
So now we're, time's limited now. It's just to, um, you were talking about segregated and, and so on. I kept yeah. reading something in the document, the vision document, about um, unsegregated between cyclists and pedestrians is now verboten. And I just wondered how that works with these shared spaces that we were admiring over the last few weeks on, on this um, show. So, so um, I, I, you have to be really careful about terminology. We're talking about shared use, not shared space. So this, this is not about, yeah, so, the, the, and, and again, so shared use is not verboten. It's simply saying it's, it is the least suitable type of cycle track. And it does say there might be situations when, you know, you, you, you're forced into that, you simply have no choice. And he talks about the, the kinds of locations where that might be more acceptable than others. So if cyclists are moving slowly, if you're you know, just coming up to a junction, it's not ideal. Maybe volumes of pedestrians are low, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it's quite wide or, or whatever. There's a reason why you might do it, but generally to be avoided, you know? Um, and, 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 and it's not so much about, you know, in the past people did lots and lots of studies about safety of shared use paths and they are generally quite safe. You can't point to a lot of collisions. It's about comfort. It's about the cyclist can't go at the speed they want to go, and that that's lacks comfort and it, and it reduces directness, and the pedestrian doesn't feel comfortable. So it's, it's about the kind of quality of the experience as much as it is about, it, rather than pointing to some direct kind of safety disbenefit. So I think that's all the reasons why, why, why that's saying. The whole shared space debate, it doesn't really get into that. I mean, I think where it would, where it would say, though, is that it would fall into this, this chart that we've got in there, which I could I could quickly show you if you if you want. Um, do you want me to I quickly flash it up? I've got I've got the I've got the thing up on screen. Let me just show you this um, handy little um, chart, uh, which I think is quite important. Um, uh, let me just try and get this up on screen if I can. Um, uh, come on, come on, come on. Um, but yeah, so I think that's where you would you know say well what level of traffic and speed of traffic um, is it appropriate for or is it not appropriate for cyclists to be uh, to not have physical protection um, and that pick up uh, that, that question really so my, sorry my computer is going really slow but let me see if I'm yeah, I think the principle is absolutely don't do it ever apart from when you have to yeah <laughs> So yeah, what a, in Manchester is like, a, have you considered absolutely everything else? And, and certainly when it comes to crossings, I make them go through this extremely long flow chart of proving that there was no other option before they get there. And then I go, right, okay, crack on. There you go, I'll fill some time for you, Phil. Yeah, can you, can you see that now? So this is, this, is, this is the chart that we spent a lot of time thinking about and looking at, looking at all kinds of published, you know, graphs and charts of this type. And we... And in the end, we decided to go for this, which um, uh, we, so we defined protected space for cycling as those three different types, fully curved cycle track, step cycle track, or light segregation. And then elsewhere, we say a fully curved cycle track can be at carriageway level, intermediate level, or footway level. Um, and, and that footway level would have previously been called segregated shared use, but we're saying that's a stupid term. So let's call it a, a fully curved cycle track that happens to be at the same level as the footway. And, and, and so that fully curved cycle track is inclusive because he says provision suitable for most people, regardless of the traffic flow and speed. You know, that's it. So you can do uh, a fully curved cycle track on a 20 mile an hour road if you want to. There's nothing preventing you doing that. And that will clearly be fully inclusive. And then step cycle track is saying, well, at 40 miles an hour, you probably, you know, you want a bit of buffer between you and the traffic. So you would lose that and same with light segregation. And then cycle lane, you can see that, that it's saying that's only really fully inclusive for 20 miles an hour at relatively low flows and mixed traffic uh, even, even more so. So that's pretty much based on Crow and, and other guides, Danish guides, but we just present it in a slightly different way that turns the emphasis on um, to inclusivity rather than a kind of acceptable, unacceptable. So if you, if you do this, uh, will, it, will, it, will it be an inclusive outcome is, that, is, is what we're sort of saying. Yeah, it's a real game changer that in the past that it's kind of inverted the pyramid here because you used to have to get to a certain speed, a certain volume, and then consider segregation. Yeah. Like Bill's gone. Always consider segregation. But here, watch out for these weaker ones, which are, I think is kind of genius, and that, that's how he talked me into it. I know Shane wanted to come in with a question. I've, uh, I've seen um, Shane. Hi, uh, um, Brian. Thanks very much. Um, 
this isn't to do with the design guidance issue now. This is about something that Bob picked up on about the billions that are going into trunk roads as opposed to the, um, uh, the cycling specific stuff. And I don't think you're going to win the climate change argument with that particular audience, but could I suggest maybe trying to direct those funds in a way that achieves the greatest diversion of arterial traffic from urban areas? Okay, in other words, let them spend their billions, but look for a way that they can use that money to provide ring routes or diversions or other ways of getting the heavy traffic out of urban areas. Because I know I thought the chat Bob was referring to the high levels of uh, motorway travel in the Netherlands, but, but I have seen it stated somewhere that they attribute their ability to do sustainable safety, to their ability to do low traffic neighborhoods to the fact that a greater proportion of their travel happens on limited access arterial roads. You know, the, a greater proportion of their motoring happens on motorways. And that's why they have the, they've removed the, the, the car capacity, the car volume from their urban areas and that lets them do other things. So that was just something I wanted to throw into the into the yeah, ring. I'll come in at first before that, Phil go on, because uh, uh, I had conversations with Highway England over in uh, Greater Manchester about the scheme, and they, they wanted to do a new bit of motorway. And we're like, fantastic, get that link in, and we can send all the cars that way and free up a high street through a town centre, which is currently carrying the stress, uh, the, the stress. So there can be some good uses for, for expanded bits of the highway network if we can kind of disaggregate things somewhat. But yeah, the, by and large, when it's road building for road's sake and kind of chasing the capacity tail, then we've got a little bit of an issue. So I, I'm more fall on the let's just sort out low traffic neighbourhoods everywhere and do all the junctions. That's that would be a much better use of the 27 billion from my point of view. But it's also convincing the bean counters that that would actually get spent because every single small thing we do has a massive like a. Uh, um, like rip tired against it, everybody kind of fighting you. So it's it's quite difficult. Whereas if you're just going to put another couple of lanes on a motorway, no one bothers you. You just crack on, spend the billions, and it's good vote winning stuff. Over <laughs> to Phil, he's probably got yeah. a slightly. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I was going to say is that the, the, I mean it's a bigger question. This about investing in big roads, but you know all the evidence is that people um, have a fixed travel time budget, and if you if you just try and speed up their journeys by giving more road capacity, what happens is people travel further in the time they've got. So it's a kind of never ending, never ending thing really. So um, I do, yeah, I mean, there's a you know, personal view. I, I do think we, we have to stop investing in, in big roads. And actually what we'll see is that um, as people travel less, local services will, will come out of the ground. The, the fact, the reason there are very few local shops in sort of, post-war suburban areas because everyone's traveling further to do their shopping somewhere else if they weren't traveling as far then the businesses would appear where they could get to them so it's kind of you know we, we're chasing our tail constantly but um that's a that's a bigger question perhaps yeah you might have hit on a topic for for another time and you burst <laughs> our bubble nicely shane good good man uh, any any more questions for for phil while we've got him we we have run past time but I just uh, I do like grilling Phil because he's uh, he's such a natural <laughs> diplomat and he really out there doing trade negotiations for us at the moment. Yeah, and really um, Phil, is there anything about because we currently cycle on dual carriageways with sixty mile an hour, like Isha to Cobham and yeah, yeah. A three hundred seven, A three hundred eight, blah blah. Is there any legislation about they must now start to put in cycleways? Osborne well, mentioned it in a budget in two thousand and twelve, I think. So. Legislation, no. I mean, this is one of the problems. The way, uh, well, it's problem. Is it the right thing or the wrong thing? But you know, the Department of Transport always say we are not a highway authority. Every highway authority is demo well, apart from Highways England, you know, has a, a democratic uh, element to it. Um, we, we, as the department, cannot direct people, uh, cannot, cannot direct highway authority to do certain things. Um, but you know. The, it will remain to be seen how much teeth active travel England is going to have. You know, I, I brought Brian <clears throat> dealt with Andrew Gilligan much more than I did um, uh, when he was at TFL, but I think he was took a very robust attitude with 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 the TFL organisation and sorry, he was with GLA, wasn't he? With TFL and with the boroughs to to kind of make make things happen, and it'll be very interesting to see um, wh whoever is the commissioner, whether it's Andrew himself or somebody else. 
um, you know, uses that that um, that the, the powers or the uh, the influence that active travelling is going to have through withdrawing funding, because that's 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 the power that government has. It can with, withhold funding. It, it can't at the moment. It doesn't have the legal powers to tell how authorities to do anything really. You know, to put in a roundabout or to put in a cycle lane or, or whatever but it can withhold funding so um it does have a lot of levers to pull so can i, I say, as 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 Tim, tim's on the call as well tim phoebe's here as well we were two of the people that did this role um years and years ago and we had no teeth at all and we were shot as the messengers so hopefully that's the one lesson that will be learned is that when councils don't like being told what to do by andrew and his team um, that team won't get just disbanded. It, they'll be they'll have they'll be given the authority to press on and actually deliver their their influencing or their their punishment or whatever it's phrased, however it's phrased, and won't just be so. Oh, sorry, you know, and uh, go away, please. And that that's the lesson that we learned from two thousand to two thousand and five, or whenever we did it. Yeah, this is yeah. telling me that um, one Bill Jones doesn't sound like he's the new director of uh, Active Travel in England. And no, the I yet. <laughs> well, I've <laughs> done it before. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're getting towards the end. Has anybody got one more really difficult question um, about what the bulging cycling is on page 58 or about or, or anything like that? <laughs> it's a cracker. That. That's good, that is. I like that. Yeah, no, I'm not a fan, not a fan of that one, but we'll have that out another time. We'll talk about bulging cycle lanes. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, I, I want to talk about the bikeability fail on page 71. I had a, a whole list of things that I was hoping to, to weave in. You've worked your way through the whole lot, haven't you, Brian? <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed, I have. Late night last night. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to talk about the... Uh, <laughs> Actually, I think Ranty's been picking up all the dodgy cycle lane ASL feeder lane nonsense. That oh, that's that's not even from 2014. That's 2004 vintage. We, we, we do we do say that ASLs is the least least um, suitable choice, and we do and we do say as well that you limit ASLs. I think to any arm of a junction with 5,000 vehicles a day. So yeah, if you follow that, you know you, you'd only be putting ASLs in on pretty quiet. Quite but, but basic okay. engineers like me were what going through looking at the pictures <laughs> and all these pictures of ASLs is like a, a cracking endorsement and the and the lack that of was, protection. That was a race, that was a racial order suggestion. He said when you're presenting the ideas, present them in reverse order. So start so we did that. So we start with segregation and then we end up with mixing and you know and and we start with and we start with cyclops, although we don't call it that, and we end with ASLs. So that there's a kind of logic to that that you you end up with the with the least suitable um, solution, hopefully. The key for me, Phil, was that uh, chart with the uh, what action you need based on the speed and traffic volume. That was a really powerful chart. You know, really simple. It just says if you uh, it doesn't say you can't do it, but it clearly says that it, on a 20 mile an hour road with above 2,000 vehicles. Uh, you're not you're excluding some cyclists you're excluding yeah. large parts of the population and that's a really key message for local authorities yeah and, and i think that played to the street so dfc were really really keen that we made this document as inclusive as possible so we kind of turned that on, on its head and said okay well that's fine so if you do that you're excluding people and clearly that's we don't want that to happen so um yeah that we we kind of turned that that to our advantage really in producing that chart 